Welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This podcast features in-depth explorations into the traditions of yoga, Sanskrit, Indian philosophy, and South Asian religions. Through candid conversations with scholars and practitioners, we will immerse in the latest and most cutting-edge research on all things yoga. Greetings, everyone, and welcome. I'm excited to have you here and to begin this new project, the Yogic Studies Podcast. It's something I've wanted to do for quite some time now, but honestly, I felt daunted by the thought of creating yet another distraction from dissertation writing. And yet, now, during the current COVID-19 pandemic, when so many of us are quarantined and stuck inside, I really felt that now was the time to have these conversations and to offer this podcast. So here we are. In this first short episode, I want to introduce you to the podcast to give you a sense of what you can expect to hear moving forward. And I'd like to begin by sharing a bit about my own journey to yogic studies, to Harvard University, and to the academic world of yoga research. One thing I'd like to do on this podcast, in addition to interviewing scholars about their fascinating research, is to learn a little bit about their biographies. What brought these diverse scholars from around the world to study yoga or Sanskrit professionally as an academic, to devote their lives to this sort of research? For myself, yoga brought me into academia really through the back door, as I like to say. My path as a yoga practitioner and former yoga teacher led me to study the deeper history and philosophical roots of yoga and the Indian traditions. I wanted to know more about where yoga came from, how and when it was first conceived, who practiced it, and why. What did yoga look like thousands of years ago? And how has yoga changed throughout the millennia as it has traveled and morphed across cultures, languages, space, and time? My passion for yoga and meditation, and some early transformative experiences in my own practice, led me to pursue a degree as an undergraduate in religious studies at Humboldt State University in Northern California. Deeply inspired by my college professors, I was introduced to the fascinating world of scholarship, and the careful study of Indian texts, histories, and religions. At the same time, I completed a yoga teacher training program and began teaching yoga, immersing myself further in the North American yoga studio culture. Pretty early on, I began to sense a growing disconnection and sometimes frustration between the largely physical movement practices of what is often today termed modern postural yoga and the philosophical and religious underpinnings that I was studying in Hindu and Buddhist scriptures during my coursework at Humboldt. After college, I set out to India and Asia on a pilgrimage of sorts in search of what I thought at the time would be a more authentic or pure Indian yoga. If I could just find that one guru, that ancient yogi meditating in a cave in the Himalayas, right? I spent about two years traveling, studying, and conducting independent research into yoga and meditation, meeting a variety of teachers from Buddhist and Hindu traditions. While I had many profound experiences during these early travels, it became more and more apparent to me that a lot of the yoga that I was being fed in India, especially in places like Rishikesh or Varanasi, the epicenters of the Dharma Trail, and which have become true hubs for global yoga tourism, they were highly influenced by the westernized yoga that I had grown up on at home in California. What is sometimes termed the pizza effect in cultural and religious studies, an intercultural feedback loop of ideas, practices, and historical projections. Now, I knew this already to some degree from my professors at Humboldt, 
but experiencing it firsthand was different. On the other hand, I also began to encounter India's ascetics and renunciate traditions, sannyasins, who had renounced the world in search of liberation. These ascetics sometimes practice forms of yoga known as tapas, or austerities, such as holding the arms overhead or standing on one leg for many years at a time. These tapas practices of self-mortification couldn't be more at odds with the broader goals of a yoga practice uh, cultivated for health and wellness purposes. So how did all of this connect? I began to grow more and more disenchanted with broad and fuzzy historical narratives surrounding the antiquity of yoga's past that were being fed to me by Indian and non-Indian teachers alike. Yoga is 5,000 years old, Vinyasa is found in the Vedas, Patanjali is the founder of yoga, and so on. Things one still hears, unfortunately, today in a 200-hour yoga teacher training. I soon realized that many of the answers to the questions I was seeking were buried in ancient palm leaf manuscripts, largely unseen by the world, and that learning Sanskrit, the classical language of India and yoga's texts, was key to accessing some of the mysteries of yoga's past. I began stacking translations of key texts like the Yoga Sutras side by side, and I realized how vastly different the English translations were, how only four or five words in Sanskrit could be interpreted so wildly differently. I began to see that there was a large gap between not only languages, but cultures, and that the sensibilities of the translator, his or herself, really made a difference. How every act of translation is also an act of interpretation, as I would later understand. I began to appreciate how vital learning Indian languages like Sanskrit were, to be able to read the text in its original language, and to try to lessen some of those gaps. All of this led me to pursue graduate studies in Sanskrit and South Asian religions. I completed a master's degree in comparative religion and Sanskrit at the University of Washington in Seattle, where I hit the ground running in intensive language training. I was quickly immersed into the world of academia and graduate studies. My MA put me in good position to apply for doctoral programs, and I entered the PhD program in South Asian religion at Harvard University in 2014, where I'm now, six years later, slowly, slowly, completing a dissertation on yoga in medieval South India. My dissertation project involves a critical edition and study of a particular Sanskrit yoga text known as the Shiva Yoga Pradipika, or Lamp on Shiva's Yoga, which I'm sure I'll have more to say about in future episodes. After leaving the Harvard campus in 2018, after having completed my coursework, teaching, general exams, dissertation prospectus, and more, now married with two young children, my family and I moved back to Northern California, where in January of 2018, I launched yogic studies out of my bedroom office. The idea behind yogic studies was simple enough to offer high quality and rigorously researched online courses in yoga's history and philosophies and to serve as continuing education for the broader yoga community. But the aim was also to try and bridge what I sometimes feel are two distant spheres of yoga discourse, the academic and the practitioner, to try to make some of the critical research on yoga studies that has emerged over the past decade, to make this knowledge more accessible and engaging for yoga teachers and practitioners. Over the past decade of my graduate studies, I've gone back and forth between India and North America, Europe and elsewhere, immersing myself with an incredible international community of university scholars and researchers 
working within a vibrant and growing academic field of yoga studies. I've been extremely fortunate to have had incredible teachers and mentors over the years in both India and the West. The pursuit of knowledge is truly a collaborative practice, and I can only stand on the shoulders of so many great thinkers and panditas of the past. Today, these yoga scholars from diverse backgrounds research and approach yoga from a variety of disciplinary perspectives, from the philology of the study of Sanskrit texts and manuscripts, to historians of religion, to anthropologists doing fieldwork among living practitioners, art historians, linguists, sociologists, and more. Some, but certainly not all of these scholars, might identify as scholar-practitioners or practitioner-scholars, a framework that is often tossed around today, but in my mind has not really yet received critical treatment or a nuanced discussion within yoga. And this is also something that I'd like to talk more about. As the yogic studies community has grown over the past two years, we now have an evolving curriculum of online courses with highly regarded teachers. On this podcast, I'll be talking with those faculty, as well as many others, about their own work, their scholarly expertise, their writings, as well as their teaching. I hope that this podcast can be a valuable resource for both the academic and practitioner communities alike, and that it can make yoga research accessible and engaging for the millions of yoga practitioners and connoisseurs around the world today. By sharing with listeners candid conversations and interviews with leading university scholars, researchers, practitioners, and educators in the world of yoga, we hope to make better sense of this endlessly fascinating thing called yoga. I hope that you enjoy this podcast. You can show your support by leaving us a review on iTunes and sharing this podcast with others. And please let me know what you think. What sort of questions and conversations would you like to hear? Who would you like me to have on as a guest? Feel free to send me an email at info at yogicstudies.com. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to sharing these conversations with you.